There we go. Okay. It'll be coming up. You just hold right now. And it looks like we might be live here. And here we go. Good. Okay. Hey, everybody. Jem Schofield here with the C47, and welcome to another live stream. I apologize for the two-minute delay. We made an adjustment here in the studio, and the Ethernet cable came loose from the computer. So here we are, and this episode is brought to you by Mimo Live. This is a solution we use for these live streams. It is a pretty amazing software solution for these types of things and it is and can be found at boinks b o i n x dot com we are also brought to you by rode microphones and they are the ones that are well supporting us in terms of our audio solutions and we are coming to you live from MCM TV in McMinnville, Oregon. So there you have it. Uh, excited to be here again. And this is the second live stream that we are doing here from the studio. Still working out a few little technical issues here and there, but I'm going to get the chat up here. Looks like we have a couple of people watching already. Uh, I tried to take the delay away, but for some reason it still seems like there's a little bit of a delay. I am Jem Schofield from the C47.com. You're obviously on my YouTube channel, so you can also uh, find videos and other content that I'm creating here at youtube.com forward slash the C47. And please, I implore you to subscribe because the more subscribers I have, the more free content I can create for you on this channel. So there you have it. Today, February 22nd, uh, 2018, and it is just after 1 p.m. here, Pacific time, on the West Coast in the Pacific Northwest, where they get freaked out about uh, snow pretty easily. Hey, Alan, what's up? Thanks for joining. Uh, C2 Learning Series is excellent. Thanks for doing those, Jem. Uh, you're welcome, Rod. I would like to thank Canon for hiring me to produce them and that they still put trust in me to create uh, what become these multi-part series. And what Rod is referring to is a multi-part series that I have created an eight-part series for Canon, specifically on the Canon uh, EOS C200. This camera right here that you can see, and we will be talking about that camera, not my left arm, uh, today in this podcast, but I'm also opening this up for just a general open discussion about digital cinema cameras, specifically cameras in the sub $10,000 price range. Uh, yes, I am now officially, you can see, uh, two ferns. So we'll see how long this lasts. I'm just having a, <laughs> I'm taking the piss a little bit because there are actually two ferns here at MCM. So why not? So, um, so today is about the C200 and the sub $10,000 US uh, digital cinema cameras. And I think this is going to be an ongoing discussion that we're going to be having about this stuff. Uh, I would like to find out if everybody can hear me properly, if the feed is clean so that there's no problem with the picture that you're seeing. So if you could, uh, in the chat, let me know about that. That would be great. Uh, we have posted a direct link to learn usa.canon.com to the eight-part series for the C200. Um, you know, when I create these, they're obviously camera-specific, but at the same time, I do want to create educational content that can carry over to general knowledge about using these camera systems. So couldn't hurt if you're a camera operator or a DP to check it out. You may come across that camera at some point anyway, so um, maybe it will help. Uh, thank you, Alan, for the confirmation. It sounds like the sound is okay. Thank you, Rode, for that. And um, 
and having a nice internet connection helps tremendously and we will continue to evolve this. Uh, the link is not working to what we posted. Okay, let me uh, check that out on my end. You are right. So we will take a look at why that's not working um, and then we will repost that link to the series. You can also go to, let's see if we've got the second link here. I'm going to have somebody check that on my end first and paste it into a browser and make sure that it is working and then uh, we will repost it again once we know that it is 100% working with a test here. Uh, but that is the link to the direct entire series on Canon's website. Canon also does have a YouTube channel. Uh, all you have to do is go to youtube.com and then type in Canon Space USA and then you will be connected to their channel and then inside of there just go to videos and you'll see the whole series there as well. Okay, so let's start off by talking about the C200 and what it is and what it is not as a camera. Uh, the only way this stuff works, everybody, is if you are in the chat and you are talking. That's the whole point of, obviously, live streams, uh, not for me to just blab the entire time. So um, if you are just showing up right now, uh, I will say that, um, you know, my name is Jem Schofield. I run the C47, which is uh, historically an educational brand, but really also handles video production projects, consulting, uh, education, and all of that kind of stuff. Please do subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps tremendously. There should be, you guys should let me know, uh, a little logo bug over there, but the subscribe link should work. And if it doesn't, let me know because we have to fix that uh, so that we don't have a problem with that. Um, good. So here we are. Uh, we'll get a, a proper link up for you guys uh, soon that will allow you to check out the series, but hopefully you'll check that out after this live stream. So let's switch over to and talk a little bit about uh, this particular camera system here, the C200. And um, I'll try to keep this little webcam as steady as possible. So this is kind of, a, a you know, the evolution of the Cinema EOS line in terms of body design. And Canon has uh, basically gone in two different directions here. They've gone in the direction of the C700, which is more of your larger format digital cinema camera that would be used for features and episodic work. Um, they see that as primarily, I think, uh, a PL mount based camera, though there is a you know, an EF mounting option. You can even get a locking EF mount. And this camera is sort of the, I would say, the best way to explain it would be the evolution um, of the C100 series, which I am very familiar with. And basically, it is a, a 4K uh, version in some respects of the C100 Mark II or UHD to be more specific. Um, and that's really what is being recorded here to the SD cards, uh, currently in an MP4 format, but there will be an MXF uh, base format in the future. It uses the same batteries as the uh, newer Cinema EOS cameras like the C300 Mark II. So uh, that's partially because of the processors and resolution and all the stuff that has to be done with the camera. And then there's this little door right here, which is kind of like the little secret door on the camera system. And that's on the side. Hold on. I'm trying to do this at the same time. And I'm all, all thumbs here. Hold on. Just give me a second. And there we go. That's the little door I'm looking for there. And I'm sorry about that. And that little door opens up what is uh, access to a CFast 2.0 slot where we can basically record onto CFast cards uh, Cinema Raw Light, which is a raw recording for the camera system. So what this means is that this camera is very much, um, even more so than when I talk about the FS7 and the FS7 Mark II from Sony, this is really kind of two cameras in one. Um, I wrote an article on my website about the FS7, the original camera, when it first came out. And with that camera, I was sort of saying it's two cameras in one because, 
you sort of have this cinema camera that you can boot up into cinema um, EI, uh, and then you can boot up the camera in a more sort of, you know, paintable broadcast style camera system. Well, this is very different with the C200. This is a camera system that uh, is really, in my opinion, to SD cards, kind of like a web uh, based content camera where you're going to be creating content for the web with the C200. And then the other side of it is um, this, you know, raw recording format. And we still seem to be having some issues with this link here. Like uh, URL. Say that again? Oh, yeah. Well, don't do that, but we're doing a straight learn.canonusa, aren't we? So, all right. So, we'll try to get this all sorted out, um, and we'll get you a good link to the series. But just going back to, um, let me just see something here. Yeah. Is it working when you paste it into your browser? That's what you have to do. You have to test it. Make sure it works when you paste it into your browser. And if it works on yours, then you copy and paste that and put it in. And we'll work that out. Okay, cool. So we'll get that worked out. So going back to sort of this two cameras in one thing, for me, the C200 is, is really, uh, you know, like a UHD webcam. Uh, it's got Canon Log3 as an option. It's a Rec. 709 camera when you're talking about that. And what I mean by that is really referring to the color space. This is very similar, again, to the uh, C100 and C100 Mark II, and also the original C300. When you're recording to those two slots, it's a Rec. 709 color space internally to those slots no matter what. So you're not picking P3, you're not picking Rec. 2020 to those car, uh, cards that you're recording to. It's always Rec. 709 for your color space. And then you can choose what your gamma curve is going to be that's defining your dynamic range from your blacks to your whites. When we get over here, I'm recording Cinema Raw Light into and onto the CFast card. Well, then we're not even talking about color space and a gamma curve. It's a, a raw recording. And basically, when you convert that, when you're using an NLE solution, um, DaVinci Resolve, uh, Avid Media Composer, or uh, at the moment Final Cut Pro 10 with support coming from Premiere Pro in the near future, essentially what's happening is it's going to convert that raw when it turns it into a video signal into Canon Log 2 and the cinema gamut, the widest gamut that uh, Canon has for their color space, which is bigger than Rec. 2020, by the way. So that's kind of what's happening there. Uh, but then you can switch it and you can change it and do all that kind of stuff. So, um, so it's kind of like two, again, cameras in one when you're talking about that. And I think that it's making it difficult for a lot of people to decide whether or not the C200 is a correct... Um, is the correct camera system for you to be using. Um, still having some issues with that link, so we're not going to post that until we know that it's uh, working 100% now, but we'll get to that point and we'll get it all sorted out. So um, I need questions. I mean, are, is there anybody here who's considering buying a sub $10,000 digital cinema camera? And that can mean... Uh, an FS7, FS7 Mark II, C300 Mark II. It could include the Ursa Mini Pro, uh, the EVA 1 from Panasonic, and of course the camera that we're also talking about right now, which is the C200. So the question is, is anybody thinking about making that purchase? If they are, is it a purchase they're trying to make as an A camera to another smaller mirrorless or DSLR that they're using? Is it that they're thinking about just getting a single one of those cameras, or are they thinking about getting multiples? Um, so Rod is asking a question, so I'm going to address that first, and then I'll wait for questions to come in or comments related to what people are trying to figure out with their camera systems. Rod's question is, anything you can share from Canon on the upcoming codec release for the C200 specs official release date? Uh, we had the, a brief question about this last week, and the answer to that is no. Um, we know that it's going to be a codec that's going to 
allow, to my understanding, uh, a, uh, a more robust connection for proxy recording between what you're doing. Let me actually show you this. Um, so here we go. Let's go back to this. So basically, if you're recording uh, onto the CFAST cards, you're recording in DCI 4K, 4096 by 2160. And there is a proxy uh, recording option where you're essentially recording 2K to the SD cards, uh, but that's going to be greatly improved when the new codec is released uh, with the camera system. So you're going to have a better link between your DCI 4K and your 2K, DCI 2K proxy recordings uh, when you're working with, uh, you know, with the camera system. Don't know exactly what the final codecs are. To my understanding, they are going to be uh, still 8-bit codecs. And again, that's what you kind of have to understand about this camera is you can have uh, kind of your cake and eat it too, but you're not getting what a lot of people may be looking for in a camera um, as a sort of day-in, day-out camera, which is they want 10-bit, they want 422. Um, but it's not always uh, white paper spec sheets. It's sort of what you're getting out of a camera that really matters. And it's kind of interesting because we've dealt with this issue for many years with the Canon Cinema EOS cameras where we essentially get online, we talk about things, we say that we are, um, you know, that we're, we're getting crippled codecs uh, compared to other camera systems, but then there's this secret sauce that Canon has when it comes to the actual image and, and, and the picture we're getting in terms of color science and, and what we can do with that, uh, which sort of uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense because it's even better than we, uh, you know, than we expected. Okay, so um, black steel. Uh, I do like the Canon Cine range. I have a 70D now looking to jump to this cam. Well, it's definitely a big step up from the 70D. Um, you know, you are getting a, a bigger dynamic range for sure with the camera system. You um, are getting all of the built-in features. I think one of the biggest ones for this camera system, and I'll get to other people's comments uh, as well, is that um, you know this is the this is the first uh, affordable cinema EOS camera from Canon that has built-in XLR inputs on the actual body of the camera. So even if you 86 the handle here uh, and you just fly their LMV1, which is their touchscreen monitor, which we have over here on this side, um, off the camera system, you're still going to get XLR inputs. In fact, even if you 86 this, if you got rid of this LMV1 and all you were using was this, the electronic viewfinder, you now have those built-in XLR inputs, which for me is really an advantage when you're trying to run and gun and you're trying to keep your camera package small. So I think that that's definitely something, you know, that people should be considering when they're thinking about using this camera system. Um, and that's a big change. That's definitely from a, a build quality standpoint. One of the things I've noticed about the C200 is it's a big evolution in terms of the camera system. Um, Alan says he owns a C300 Mark II, hoping for the new MX firmware update to the C200 to be at least 8-bit 422, not 420. Me too, Alan. Uh, I absolutely love the C300 Mark II, but there's some things about the C200 um, that I really like. I will be uh, posting on Abel Cine's YouTube channel, or Abel will be posting a video about the new C300 Mark II firmware that came out in December of 2017. It's not up yet, but should be in the next couple of days. And what's really interesting about that firmware update is that it, it kind of breathes uh, new or a different life into the C300 Mark II because that firmware update actually supports this touchscreen here, the LMV1, and combined with the MA400 audio unit, you can sort of configure your C300 Mark II in a way that you couldn't before. And you will also be adding um, a touchscreen for the dual pixel CMOS AF. So that's pretty cool stuff, and uh, that should be up to you. Patrick says he's still in school, just learning as much as I can uh, until you have funds for a C200 or the C300 series. Good, good. Um, 
So good. That alone is fantastic uh, about the audio because you have a, uh, you have three Sennheiser AVXs, which are great. Uh, cool. That's great. Um, so what are the questions about this camera system or other cameras or comparisons or things that you'd like to try to sort out when you are talking about this stuff? Let's see what we have here. Been shooting with the 1D X Mark II and in love with the slow motion, but want to upgrade to a cinema camera. How does the slow motion compare with bit rates and quality of image, etc.? 1D X Mark II is a great camera. I mean, it's a DSLR. It's really Canon's flagship DSLR camera. Um, it does shoot in 4K. It creates a lovely image. I think the slow mo that comes out of that camera at 60 is very, very nice. I'm very happy with the slow motion on the C200. Um, you know, you have to understand how it works, and the training series sort of covers it. When you're in HD, uh, you know, you are actually, uh, you know, 10-bit on this camera if you want to be when you're going, uh, especially out of the SDI, out of the camera. Uh, and you can go to higher frame rates. Really, the frame rate is 120 frames per second on this camera. And then when you're in any other, um, you know, uh, resolution, it's a 60 P camera and it's not conformed in camera like the 120 is for HD you are going to conform in post so if you shoot at 60 in UHD or in DCI 4K on the camera system you are going to be conforming in post so if you wanted to wind up at uh, 24 basically it's a 40 percent uh, playback speed but looks really nice. Um, I would say that the 120 is, is slightly soft, uh, but the 60 is solid on the camera system. And for Canon, that's kind of a, a big deal, you know, that we're getting a 4K camera that has 60. Um, Off-speed recording, especially overcranking, has not been Canon's strength over the years. There's been a lot of other things that are, including their dual-pixel CMOS AF system for the uh, autofocus, which still, for the most part, is probably the best um, large sensor AF system that exists on the market. So other questions that you guys have about this C200, about other cameras, Evo 1, uh, FS7 series from Sony. I do have experience with all of those. Less experience with the Ursa Mini Pro, though I'm trying to get a uh, unit in from Blackmagic Design so I can have a play with that more in depth. I used the camera when it first came to market, uh, pre the whole user interface upgrade and a whole bunch of other changes that they've made to it. So it, it's not fair for me to say really or pass judgment on that camera yet because I haven't had enough experience uh, hands-on with it to say you know what my feelings are uh, overall with the Ursa Mini Pro. Um, I'm definitely not taking it out of the equation. I think it's a camera system that should be considered. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have, and I've talked about this in the past, is when a company comes to market with uh, cameras and they're not necessarily structured like a, a camera company, you know, Sony, Panasonic, Canon, obviously Airy, um, you know, so yep. Any love for the C300 Mark I still, C200 owner here, but interested in C300 used. So, um, so let's address that one for the Hitmen first. Uh, absolutely love for the C300 Mark I. Uh, still a lot of love for the C100 series. I still own two C100 Mark I's and they still work. Uh, they don't mean work like they turn on. They still are working cameras. I'm still using them on productions. Um, but it's a, it's really... Uh, we're we're moving very rapidly to a world where if the vast majority of displays that are being sold that are going to be in people's living rooms are ultra high definition, 3840 by 2160, which they are, uh, that when you're creating and generating content now that you want to live in the world for a while, it would make a lot more sense for you to consider 
getting a camera that has the capabilities of shooting and recording in ultra high definition. So the image is beautiful with the C300. There's no reason why you can't use that camera system. And you can get one used for not a lot of money. Um, but quite honestly, at this point, with the price points that we're getting with some of these newer digital cinema cameras, starting sort of with the FS5 and then moving up all the way to the C300 Mark II, I think you should really be considering uh, a UHD-based camera system because it's not two or three years ago, and we may master now in UHD and push stuff to 1080 to the world, but um, clients and projects are going to benefit from UHD in a, a large way in the future. Um, so any tips when filming with two C200s and would like to sync time code? Well, um, you know, there is no time code port on this particular camera system that we're talking about here. Um, it's just not there. Uh, where is that camera? It's over there somewhere. Oh, I see. Okay. It's down below. Um, so what we wind up doing is we wind up slating um, all of our takes. And we also do the standard where we go in and we set up our camera with a free run time of day time code and we do a one two three and then we depress uh, the joystick so that we can set that time code and we usually do that a couple of times a day. It's not ideal but it is um, the way that we're doing it. There are some audio based time code sync solutions out there. Um, I don't think that they're 100% reliable so I would tend to slate and then uh, you know get your time code as close as possible uh, the way I just mentioned. Um, so for Patrick, he's asking, you know, he's, they're using the C100 Mark I's and the C300 Mark II's. What are some of the big pros and cons, uh, and how do they compare to the C200? So let's do that right now. Um, actually, I'm going to answer Alan's question. Uh, focus pulling with the touchscreen on the C200 is much faster than using a WFT 8A wireless unit uh, and an iPad. You don't have the latency issues, and uh, it's really just instantaneous feedback. You just have to be careful when using a touchscreen with a camera like that. Uh, sometimes you might want to mount it off the camera body just so that you don't have vibrations. Uh, you're welcome to Hitman. Uh, so let's go back to Patrick. We use the C100 Mark II and C300 Mark II. What are some of the big pros and cons? Uh, comparing to the C200. Well, let's let's get into first of all uh, a comparison, and and let's segment this because I don't think it's really fair to compare it to the C100 Mark II. That's a an HD based camera that has a 4K sensor. It has great color science. Um, it is a 709 only camera, and when you're recording internally to the C200, it's very similar. But of course, you can do that in UHD as well. Um, so. It's really, to me, a comparison between the C300 Mark II and the C200 if we're talking Canon to Canon. Uh, and let's go ahead and do that. Um, so the first thing for me is C300 Mark II has all of the professional terminals or ports that you would expect on a camera like that. So you've got a timecode port. You have a Genlock port, which is really to handle phase, potential phase issues when you're doing especially live events. So you don't want to switch from one camera to the other and have and be on a partial frame. Uh, you have a monitor out terminal that can be used to spit out up to a DCI 4K signal with or without overlays. And then you have a rec terminal, which can spit out a f up to 4K uh, DCI 4K signal, uh, which is uncompressed, as is the monitor terminal if you want it to be. Uh, so that you can go to external recorders, you can go to external monitor solutions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, those are some of the big ones. You've got dual CFast slots. Uh, you can record in codecs on the C300 Mark II that are not available on the C200. Um, you're recording basically in UHD on that camera at 410 megabits per second. So you have 10 bit 422, 400 megabits per second. Um, it's a beast of a little camera in terms of what you can do. And the fact that it's been on the market for so long um, is pretty amazing. Uh, still having problems, don't click on that last link 
to the training series. We're not quite sure what's happening with that link to the Canon tutorial series and why it's not working, um, but we will get that sorted out. So I'm going to get back to my thoughts and, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll get all that. So hold on, just... Um, that, that may have been an old link that we were grabbing from the um, from a, a social media link from Canon and we'll just have to see if we can get that all sorted out in terms of the training series at some point. Um, again, best way right now to check that out is to go to youtube.com and you can just go to Canon USA and you can click on and get to the series there. Uh, it'll be in the, in the videos section there in terms of the series. And then we will uh, get and post a proper link to the series for the C200 when we have that uh, up. I'm actually doing a quick look right here. So let me just see if I can get this up here. And it's interesting because I'm actually checking out right now the Canon website and I'm not seeing any links to that series right now. So maybe it's just living on the um, YouTube channel at the moment. So I'm just going to take this just for one more second because I'm trying to get you guys a proper link here and see if I can do that. And if I cannot, then we will just continue the conversation about this camera system. Uh, so let's see, learn dot. Yeah, I think that they are changing something on their website because I'm doing a search here and that was a valid link prior to as far as I know, uh, but there's something that has changed. So we'll see what that is. I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so here we go. Um, so back to the comparison with the C300 Mark II and the C200. So uh, codecs in general for day in, day out, uh, MXF codecs on the C300 Mark II are very robust. A uh, lot that you can do with the image and for me, uh, just a workhorse camera if what you're trying to do is crank out uh, 24 or 30 frames per second content. The fact that that camera's been out for a few years and is still what it is, uh, I think is absolutely worth uh, $10,000 US. But the C200 um, is, uh, you know, is basically about $7,500 US. It gives you cinema raw light, which is amazing. Um, dynamic range when you're using uh, and shooting in cinema raw light is actually as good, if not better, than the C300 Mark II. And you're talking about a data rate recording-wise, which is a plus and a minus, uh, one gigabit per second uh, as opposed to 410 megabits per second uh, really means that you're getting a you know a file that's more than twice the size of the uh, C300 Mark II when you're recording in 4K uh, but then you know you also have the option to go UHD to the SD cards at a much lower data rate 150 megabits per second so it's kind of a, a plus and a minus in terms of what you, you've got. Um, there's other things. Form factor, uh, I think they've improved the body design on the C200. It's uh, thought out very, very well. Love the built-in XLR inputs and also the fact that um, that screen is there. But again, you can add that screen to the C300 Mark II now with the latest firmware update. So you can spend $700 and you can get that touch screen onto the C300 Mark II and it works fantastically well. Um, the W image. Thoughts on when a firmware update will come out for the C200? I've addressed that. I don't know when. I've heard if you record RAW to the CFAST, you can output 2K 10-bit out of the SDI. Uh, would the record limit be based on the size of the CFAST card? Well, um, you can do HD out of the SDI. You might be able to do uh, a DCI uh, 2K, which is not much different than that in terms of resolution, 2160 by 1080. Uh, but yes, so, um, so yeah, you're welcome, Patrick. Hopefully that helped. Uh, again, we're still having problems with that learn.usa.canon.com link. We're going to stop posting that for now. Yeah, no, there was another one that got posted though. It's okay. 
Um, so we're just going to hold on that until we can get a successful link that works on there. We're going to go into learn.usa.learn.usa.canon.com, uh, uh, and we're going to see if we can find that link again and see what the heck is going on with that in terms of things. So what other questions do we have from people that are related to the um, the C200? And, and again, really, not necessarily just the C200. We're talking about cameras that are in this price point. And, you know, what do we have here? Um, and what are they? I'm going to try one other link here and see how it works. I'm going to post it here. And let's just see if this works. Um, let's go ahead and... So here's the deal, everybody. I don't know how to fix this. We are posting the correct link into the um, links for the live stream. They are the absolutely correct links. But the issue that we're having is that when you click on it through the chat, it will not go to the page. But when I click on the link uh, directly, and I go to it, it is working. So the gallery and the information is there. I do not know why you cannot actually um, get into that and why it will not work. Um, but we're going to see, let's see what happens when you, when you click on this. And let's see, I'm trying this, everybody. Nope. So I don't know. There's something about uh, copying the links from Canon's website and then trying to paste those into things that is creating an issue. What were you saying over there, Jess? It looks like you can um, It might work, but I don't get what the heck is going on here, to be honest with you, um, because you are copying and putting in the correct link. And when I go to YouTube and I see a direct link to the series, it's working. So let's just hold off on that. Um, and, and see what is going on. It seems to be, and the big problem is that when we post it into the chat itself, that's when everything falls apart, and then you click on it. But if you go to you know Twitter and somebody has a link to it, it's working fine. So we apologize for that, and um, what can I say except for zeros and ones? Okay, so uh, appreciate the content. Uh, you're welcome. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, okay, so Alan's been having trouble with Canon's site all morning as well, so that might be part of the problem, so good to know that. Uh, maybe it's an intermittent thing where it's working sometimes and not, but I do think there is definitely a disconnect between uh, taking that link and putting it into the chat here for some reason. Um, you know, we can try a tiny URL thing and see if that works. It's rejected by tiny URL. Okay. No, yeah, we, we've tried that. So we've tried tiny URL as well. Uh, and we're within the character limit, which is 200 characters. It's about 120 for the URL. So we got more stuff to learn um, about this whole thing. So let's see what else I can talk about just for a couple more minutes, and I'll just wait for any other questions that people have, because again, this is an open forum. I will also open this up to general production questions, uh, more specifically things that you're dealing with in small to no crew production situations. Uh, again, if you're showing up, my name is Jem Schofield, the C47.com, and I do ask you that if you like this content to subscribe. Please let me know again if next to that subscribe button, if you see the little logo bug that should be part of all the content I create for my YouTube channel because that has a link to subscribe to my channel. Um, let me know about that if you can, somebody out there, or I don't know who's still there. So, um, so other cameras in this price point, uh, obviously the, the most obvious one is the new Panasonic EVO 1, uh, which is a camera system which price-wise is very, very similar to the uh, C200, uh, but a very, very different camera system. You're not buying that camera system for its autofocus capabilities. You are buying that camera system for the fact that it can record directly to SD cards at 10-bit 422. Uh, it has a very nice image. It has a dual ISO um, option, and um, 
I would say build quality. Uh, Canon definitely takes the cake. I prefer the color science a little bit, um, but there you go. So the Hitman, do you know if Canon are aware of the problems with Final Cut Pro 10 crashing with C200 footage? Um, I don't know if they're aware. Um, that is something that I can bring up to them. I have been working with C200 footage pretty consistently for the last month and a half to two months, not just when I did the camera series, but creating a lot of content with the camera. And I have not at the moment um, had an issue with that. And that is both with the native uh, MP4 recordings in UHD to the SD cards, and it is also true for the um, Cinema Raw Lite uh, using the Final Cut, pardon me, Final Cut Pro 10 plugin. I can't take that back in a live stream. It's just the way it's going to be. Uh, so, you know, I think that this may come down to a specific system, but I really have not had any issues at all. Um, and I'm pretty tuned into that kind of stuff. And we've been putting both types of footage into that. Um, so BD, uh, there's no missing words on the upcoming firmware update in the sense that we don't know when it's going to be. We know that there's going to be uh, some new codecs to the SD card slots, and I don't really know what else is going to happen. Um, so, ooh, let's see. So we got a, oh, so maybe, I see. So now we're going to try to put in, instead of a bit sort of just being a straight link, give me one second here. Boys and girls, kiddos. Nope, that doesn't work either. Um, okay, so we're done. We're not posting any more links to this series because either Canon's way of dealing with their links to their website or something else is crazy insane. Oh, now I'm getting some real meaty questions here, so let's go ahead. Uh, Alan, does the C200 look as good as the C300 Mark II with cheap EFS lenses? Any lens I put on the C300 looks awesome. I would imagine the C200 the same like the 10 to 18 lens. Um, I would say I would agree with you on that. Uh, absolutely. It's um, similar. Uh, I, I would only say this about the C300 Mark II. You have to understand that the C300 Mark II gives you, when you're not talking about uh, Cinema Raw Light, when you're talking about recording to the cards, uh, in that case, CFast cards, you have expanded color options. Um, you you have more choices in terms of what the, the options are in terms of combinations. But essentially, color science-wise, um, we've been doing some tests. It's much harder to match the C200 uh, with the C100 series, and I don't mean it's impossible. It's just... Um, those sensors are quite a bit different, and we're finding that when you're setting up the dumbing down the C300 Mark II a little bit, when you're trying to set it up and match it with the uh, C200, works very, very well in terms of stuff. So I think you're good to go there. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. It's when we read time footage and add transitions, text, what is. Uh, oh, okay. So that's, hmm, okay. So I don't know. Uh, we're not having problems with transitions. Uh, we're doing a little bit of retiming, but not a lot with the footage. Um, and I'm assuming you're talking about when you are over cranking at, let's say, 60 and then uh, conforming that in post to 24. Uh, so I'll have to do some tests on that and see. I'm on a MacBook Pro a um, couple of years old, and 2016, and not having an issue. So I'm also wondering if we're running into anything related to GPU or anything like that when you're doing that kind of stuff. Rod, in RAW C-Log3, I understand proper exposure would be around 34.4 IRE. Would you happen to know what the proper IRE would be for 4K MP4 preset BT709? Well, if it's Canon Log3, it's going to be basically the same because what you're doing is you're exposing for the log gamma, not for the color space. So when you are looking at recommendations from a manufacturer for where to expose in terms of IRE for log recording, it is based on that log gamma curve, Canon Log 2, Canon Log, Canon Log 3. Um, so, um, you know, it's, um, for me, you know, there's a formula 
that I tend to abide by for the most part with most digital cinema cameras when I am using uh, a log recording. And, and, and that could be raw as well because we're looking at similar, basically, gamma curves, which is I'm generally exposing more along and in the average of 40 IRE uh, and then looking to make sure that my highlights are being protected. You don't have to do that. It's not set in stone. But I found that across the boards, I tend to be adjusting an image more down rather than up when I am exposing uh, for log at around 40 IRE. And I don't want to expose too low uh, because then I might be raising the image up in post-production and that's going to generate more noise. So the Hitman, uh, thanks for the answer. One more, big issues with vignetting and raw light with non-full frame lenses because of DCI 4K. Any recommendations for all round lenses for this use? Um, it's going to be lens to lens. Um, you know, the sensor is a super 35 millimeter sensor. So it really is surprising that you're having that much of a problem. I'd be interested to know... Uh, oh, with non-full frame. Well, you can go into the camera system, and if they're Canon lenses, then there's generally some options for peripheral illumination correction and things like that. So you might have to go in and make uh, those choices inside of the camera system. Uh, let me just see where those are right now. So we'll fire this up. And we're going to go in and take a look at that. Let's see if we can do this in a way that is somewhat not ridiculous. Um, so we're going to go into menu here. And I'm just going to look. We're going to be in the camera setup menu. And we're going to go down here. And we want the, um, this is again for Canon. Sorry, guys. Let's find this. So here we go. So one of the options here is called Zoom Iris Correction, and you want to turn that off, I mean, sorry, turn that on, on, when you're using uh, Cinema EOS uh, cameras. And then, see if I have it in here, it might depend on the lens we have. Here we go. Then we have these two options as well, um, which is Peripheral Illumination Correction and Chromatic Aberration Correction, and tend to have those on as well. And when you're doing that, um, especially when you're using EFS lenses, um, even though those should cover Super 35, um, that will probably handle most of your issues regarding that. Um, but, you know, that's a correction that's really metadata-based for Canon uh, EF and EFS lenses. For instance, the latest firmware update for the C300 Mark II, which was released in December of 2017, which does support that touchscreen, you know, LMV1 monitor from the C200, uh, that also included some peripheral illumination and chromatic aberration correction support for a few more lenses, uh, EF and EFS lenses. So, um, so here's a question. Um, are all the C200 EF mounts or also PL, and what are third-party lens available for it? So uh, the answer to that question is you can get the camera um, as an EF mount camera standardly. Um, there is also a PL mount option with the camera, and so you can do that. And third-party lenses um, really then becomes EF mount or PL mount, unless you're going to get a lens adapter and add that to the mix. Um, that's the answer to that. So there's a lot of EF mount lenses, tons, um, and then there's a lot of PL mount lenses. Um, you commit to one or the other, and it's not a user-changeable mount system for the C200 like it is for some other cameras. So you do actually have to have the camera sent in if you got it with the EF mount and you want to convert it to PL mount. Uh, curious of your opinion on the Canon RAW software. It's okay. I mean, it handles what's coming off of the camera system and reads all of the metadata very, very well. So from that standpoint, I like it. I like that I can quickly and easy, easily see what I can do with it, and I have transcoding options. Uh, so similar to Red Software, I would say that. I think the reality is that most of us in the real world just want to have native support within the application or applications that we're using all of the time. So, so uh, you know, the, the, the 
I think it's Cinema Raw Development Software, is not really what I would go to um, all of the time. So here we have a question about the auto audio limiter. I saw this question actually on the uh, YouTube channel for Canon, and I didn't know how to answer that question, and I'm waiting for Canon's answer about whether or not the audio limiter is analog or not. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, my best guess would be no, but I'm not going to put myself out there and say that's um, true. And I don't know if when you're controlling the level of uh, tracks three and four safety tracks, if that signal is sent before or after the preamps of channel one and two. Um, it's definitely not going to be, it's not going to be uh, in the user manual. I can almost guarantee you that. So I would just keep hammering away um, at Canon on that to get an answer because I really don't know the answer to that. The way I'm using the camera system most of the time is I'm going into channels one and two on the camera body and I'm setting up uh, safeties sometimes on three and four, uh, but I don't know the signal routing, routing for that. So um, you know that's the best I can tell you right now. If you find out, you better let me know as well because I know a lot about these things, but I don't have the answer to that question. So keep hammering away at them. I saw your question again on Canon USA's YouTube channel. Uh, and please just keep answer, asking the question, especially on that episode that has to do with audio. Um, and see what they say. Okay, um, what else do we have out there in terms of questions? This has been pretty good. I'm uh, pretty excited about that. Oh, look at this. I have news for you if I can get this link to work. And here we go. We'll find out if the YouTube's is, uh, if this is really a Canon USA thing or something else. Let's see. Uh, man, let's see if it works. See, that worked. Nope. Okay, so you know, Canon, I mean, not Canon, uh, YouTube, you kind of suck when it comes to this. We're going to have to figure this whole thing out with these links. Uh, what I was trying to send you a link to was the fact that the new episode that I shot about the C300 Mark II firmware, which is 1.1 Point zero point one point zero zero. Imagine how many times I had to say that to remember it in the video. Uh, is out and it talks about using the monitor unit from the C two hundred with the C three hundred Mark II, along with the MA four hundred, which is the microphone adapter. So um, you can go to ablecine.com and you can go to their learn section under blog slash knowledge, and you will see a link to it right there, uh, ablecine.com. Click on the learn link and then choose, again, blog forward slash knowledge, and you will see a link to the video right there. Or you can go to the Ablecine YouTube channel and you will see the video there. Uh, let's see. Did it work? Nope. It didn't work. We keep trying. We're failing miserably, but we're starting to realize that YouTube sucks when it comes to allowing you to post links into chat. Uh, maybe that's on purpose. Maybe there's something we don't know about when it comes to that. Uh, good. So what can I say other than that? I think we are coming to an end of this whole thing. And I think that for this episode, hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully I've answered for the most part, uh, except for this one audio question, uh, the questions that you've had about this camera system. Uh, I think we're back next Thursday. So let's keep this going. And as I said before, uh, I'm this dude right here, Jem Schofield from the C47.com uh, video production, consulting, education, all kinds of things. You can subscribe. Nobody's told me if there's a logo bug on this episode always, but if you click on that, it will let you do that. Um, you cannot conform anamorphic in-camera to my knowledge. Uh, I haven't seen that option in there, but I'll look into that a little bit further. Uh, that was a quick question that came in towards the end. Um, again, 
uh, I should probably do the, what do you call it, the shout out thing. This is made with Mimo Live. Uh, it's, it's really a software based platform for doing this. And it works very, very well. It's from the fine folks at Boinks Software. Uh, also supported by Rode Microphones. Love those guys and gals down under and the products that they make. And we're coming to you from MCM TV in McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, great little studio space. I've got two ferns. What could be better? I'm excited about this. So um, I think there you go. That's what we have for this episode. I'll come up with something for next week. But as I've said in the past, um, I want suggestions. So if you have ideas for the live stream, then you just have to go to the c47.com and you just go over to the contact page and give me a recommendation for what you want the topic to be. And more than likely, I'll be happy to make that the topic um, for that live stream. So thank you very much. Hope you learned something again. We've got a lot more content planned for the future, not only in this live stream format, but in other ways as well. I'm signing off. Uh, Jem Schofield from the C47, and thanks for watching.